Good afternoon and welcome to an afternoon with Hamid Mehta and Armin Navavi. Before we get started, I want to thank everyone for coming and to thank Dale Beierstein, Carrie Chapman for their help in organizing this event and giving us this fantastic space at Langara College, which is on unceded Musqueam territory, and Jules Claussen for being Hemant's excellent host. So Hemant, Hemant and Armin have been brought here today by the BC Humanist Association. Most of you in this room either know what humanism is and or you're members of BC Humanist Association. But for those of you who aren't, bear with me for a moment. What is humanism, you ask? Humanism is a philosophy and morality based on secular values. Humanism works on behalf of non-religious people who wish to live ethical lives on the basis of reason and humanity. Humanists look to science as the best way to understand and participate in the natural world. We look to art to embrace and inspire us and compassion to guide our activities and community. We seek to create societies that promote the equal treatment of everyone. If you want to know more about BCHA and what we do, Please ask any of our members, raise your hands, members. Oh, look at all of us. Or visit our website. We're going to start the afternoon with Hammond. Hammond is the editor of Friendly Atheist, appears on the Atheist Voice channel on YouTube, and co-hosts the Friendly Atheist podcast. Prior to being a full-time voice for engaged atheism, Hammond taught high school math for seven years in the Chicago area. Seven years high school math. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> he is the author of several books, which I encourage him to shamelessly advertise. I Sold My Soul on eBay and The Friendly Atheist Survival Guide among them. We have copies out front. And today he's actually going to speak about the social landscape for young atheists. Before we get started with Hemant, I am going to introduce Armin as well, so we can go straight from Hemant, Q&A, and then to Armin. Armin, do you want to stand up? I just wanted to make you stand up. <laughs> Armin is a former Muslim, author of Why There Is No God, and the founder of Atheist Republic, a nonprofit organization with over one million fans and followers worldwide. It's dedicated to offering a safe community for atheists to share ideas and meet like-minded individuals. Armin was born and raised in the Islamic Republic of Iran and was indoctrinated thoroughly, as he says, in the Muslim tradition. As a result of an event which almost caused his death in the pursuit of God's grace, Armin became motivated to seek a broader understanding of concepts of God and religious beliefs. Uh, please welcome Hemant and Armin, and Hemant will start. Right. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. At any point you can, just like wave and I'll, excuse me. Teacher voice. Teacher voice, right? <laughs> um, yeah, thank you to Sue and Jules and everyone at BC Humanist and Armin for uh, being here too. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, what I want to talk about is what's happening with younger atheists and why this is, it's changing really quickly. And I think it applies to Canada as much as it does in the US too. So uh, let me start by giving you a quick story. Years ago, I did this weird experiment where I said I would go to church because I'd never been to church. I'd go to church for wherever the highest bidder on eBay wanted me to go, and this pastor won me for like $500. <laughs> and he, I owed him 50 weeks of church for that. <laughs> so yeah, totally backfired. <laughs> so he said, don't do that because he was Christian. He's like, I don't want you to not like church. So we'll make a deal. I live in Chicago. He said, go to 10 churches in Chicago. He would pick them up for me, 10 different ones. And I would go to all these 10 churches, and then I'd write about my experiences on his website, on his ministry's website. Because he was thinking, I want Christians to understand what they look like to people who don't believe. Because a lot of these churches have seeker services. They want to reach all the people in this room, basically, right? So like, well, here's one who's going to your church. Let's see what he has to say about it. So that's what we ended up doing. I went to 10 churches. I wrote about it. And the amazing thing is, in the comment threads on his website, you know, that's always a scary prospect of, one, an atheist going to a Christian's website, writing, here's what I didn't like about your church, and then you have a bunch of comments. The comments were unbelievable. They were great. You had Christians saying, yeah, I don't like it when my pastor does that either. Or you had atheists chiming in saying, that's why I left church. Like, it was a very positive discussion. And it turned out this pastor had written a book before. So, and it was getting some media coverage, so his publishers loved it, because every time they talked about the auction and me going to church, they mentioned this guy's book. 
And they were watching us, and they were like, well, this is weird that an atheist can go to church and criticize it, and say some nice things every now and then, but criticize it a lot. And Christians seem to love it. So they're like, after you're done going to church for this guy, why don't you go to church for us, and we'll send you to like two dozen more churches, and we'll write a book. So I've been to like 30 churches now, it's way too many churches. Um, but anyway, I wrote this book called I Sold My Soul on eBay, which is all about my church visits to all these places. And I got an in invitation from this guy who said, can you come to my school and talk about your church visits? And it turns out he goes to a very strict Christian school in the South, uh, in the U.S. And he says, like, every year we try to bring in somebody whose beliefs are totally different from that of the student body. So a couple of years ago, we brought in a feminist. Um, last, year, last year, we brought in a Democrat. So, so let's bring in an atheist, right? And then, here's the best part. P.S. Don't tell anybody. I'm an atheist, too. Oh. <laughs> and he was like student body president at wow. this school. And this is a school that makes you sign a contract that says you believe all this stuff. Like, he could be expelled if it was found out. So anyway, I go to this school, and it was, it was a creepy kind of audience, because they totally didn't like anything I had to say. But afterwards, I got to go out with this guy who invited me, and a couple of his friends, like two of his friends, and one professor. And these were the only people who knew he was an atheist and they weren't going to tell anybody, so he felt safe around them. <clears throat> and I say all this to get to the point, which is, one of his friends was a teacher. She taught Sunday school, and I was a teacher too. So we were talking about curriculums and, you know, how does it work at a church versus at a public school, and do they tell you what you have to teach the kids? And she said she teaches eight-year-olds, and basically they tell her you have to teach them the following things this weekend, and she has a little bit of leeway in terms of how to share it with them. And one weekend they said, we're going to give you a bunch of gingerbread men cutouts, just like that. And all the eight-year-olds need to draw a picture of what a Christian looks like. I'm like, what do you draw? Think about that one for a second. And she's like, that's, that's a weird thing to ask. Like, what are they going to draw, just white people? <laughs> Christians don't look alike, that's stupid. And they're like, uh-huh. And then here's some more gingerbread men. Then have the kids draw what a non-Christian looks like. I was uh, like, oh, this is going to be bad. <laughs> so she tries explaining to these eight-year-olds, like, you, you can't know what someone believes just by what they look like. You have to talk to them. You have to get to know them first. Uh, but then she had to give them the gingerbread men. So she saved one of their drawings for me, thinking I would appreciate it. Here is what one eight-year-old said a good Christian looks like. <laughs> He has a banana in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> you've ever seen the Ray Comfort video. <laughs> he has the cross. I don't know if you can see the bubble. He's saying, I love God. Combed yeah. hair, freckles, um, his perfectly tucked in shirt. I mean, everything about this picture says wholesome, perfect. This guy's not going to cause you any trouble. It's wonderful. Then the same eight-year-old, this is what he drew of someone who did not have Jesus in his life. <laughs> That's all of you. Look at how bad this gets. I mean, this guy has alcohol in one hand. He has tattoos that are coming out of his skin. He's happy. He's still smiling. He still has freckles. He has piercings. He has hair that hasn't been combed in forever. If you, I don't know if you can see what he says. He's saying, cussing, God isn't real. <laughs> Look at the anger with which this kid colored in the clothing. It's like, you have to be like that to color it in that way. And then the guy was so angry, he ripped off his sleeves. I, I thought the uni, unibrow was unnecessary. Why did he go that far? <laughs> was the smile part of the template already? Or yeah, the smile was part of the template. <laughs> I think so are the freckles now that you've mentioned it. But, but yeah, it says smoking. <laughs> so after all, the, here's the thing though. Where is this kid getting this information from? I really don't think they're sitting him down at church and saying, here's what a Christian looks like, here's what a non-Christian non looks like. I don't think his parents are telling him this. It's the Sunday school teacher wasn't. So where is he getting this from? And it's just kind of this environment that he grows up in that says, if you have God in your life, you're moral, you're good, everything about you is great. And if you don't have God in your life, what have we heard the studies say? You're untrustworthy, you're immoral, um, things like that. 
So this kid is growing up in this environment. And think about this, he's eight. What happens if the first time he breaks out of this bubble is when he goes to high school and he goes to like a public high school? How is he going to do group projects? How is he going to make friends with people who are not Christian? And what's that interaction going to be like? It's, it's not going to be good. But worse yet, knowing where this kid grew up in, in this like a very, very Christian environment, what would happen if the first time he met someone who was not a Christian is when he goes to college? And then you've got to be, you've got to work together with people a lot more. What if he goes to a Christian college? At some point, he has to break out of this bubble. And it's not going to be pretty when it happens if this is the mentality that he's being raised in. So this has happened. We've seen what happens when this plays out. So like 10 years ago, it turns out there was a girl named Nicole who moved to a really, like the panhandle of Oklahoma, very Bible Belt, very rural area. And she was a freshman in high school. So I moved when I was a freshman in high school. Worst time of my life because I had to leave all my friends. I had to go into a big high school where I didn't know anybody and like start my first day of school with like not knowing anybody. It, it was horrible. So I get where she's coming from. She's moving into this place, small school. She doesn't know anybody. What do you do if you're trying to meet people? She figures, well, I'll join a team or I'll join a club or something. So she tries. She's athletic. So she tries out for the football team. And she makes it. She's really good. I think she was the place kicker or something, but she was really good. And she said the fall went, and it was great, and the guys on the team treated her really well, so she enjoyed it. And then winter came around, and she's like, all right, what do I try out for next? How do I meet more people? So she tries out for girls basketball, and she makes the team again. Of course she makes the team. And so at the end of their first game, if you, how many of you played Little League or some sort of youth uh, sport of any kind? A lot of people. What do you do at the end of a game? You meet up at like midfield, I played soccer, so we met up at midfield, you shake the hands of the other team after win or lose, you say good game, then you go home and cry, that's what we were done. <laughs> <laughs> so Nicole, it turns out after the game ended, her team went to center court, and so did the other team, and they all held hands, and they all said the Lord's Prayer. And she's like, well that's, that's weird, I didn't expect that. She was the only one who didn't expect to have it seen. But she, here's the thing. She was an atheist. She said, I don't want to be a part of the circle. Not because I'm an atheist. Here's how nice of a person she was. She said, I don't want to join them because, well, I don't believe what they do. And it would be disrespectful to them if someone who wasn't Christian joined their circle. So she's like, coach, what do I do? I'm an atheist. He's like, go to the locker room then. So she did. And you would think that's the end of the story. And it totally wasn't because that weekend, her coach decided there needed to be a meeting about this situation. So he met up with the superintendent of the district and the principal, and they decided that Nicole needed to be kicked off the team. Oh. Oh. And they didn't even have the decency to tell her this. The way she found out is she looks at the roster for their next game, like a few days later, and her name's not on it. And she's like, coach, why am I not playing today? He's like, well, you're bad for team morale, and you threatened to steal somebody, sh and you stole somebody's shoes. She's like, I'm not bad for team morale. I show up early to practice to run laps. And like, how, I didn't steal anyone's shoes. I borrowed shoes from another girl on the team, but then I gave them back to her. And she said, thank you. And I said, you're welcome. And everyone saw me do it. Like, so what's that all about? It didn't matter. She was off the team. And get this, you go, you go to a really small school where like everyone knows each other. They all knew why she was really kicked off the team. It's because she was an atheist. So of course they start harassing this poor girl. So they start, you know, seeing her in the hallway. They they talk to themselves when she passes in the hallway. When they say the Pledge of Allegiance, they're all looking at her like under God, that sort of thing. This was 2004. So uh, John Kerry was running against George W. Bush, and in one of their government classes, I guess she said if she was old enough to vote, she would have voted for John Kerry for whatever reason. And th at that point, the kids all started calling her gay. Because that makes sense. Her parents were mixed race, so they called her half breed. Oh, yeah. And oh, it gets worse. She goes to the bathroom during class. Her or asks for, you know, can I go to the bathroom? She goes. The teacher said to the class, I hate that girl. Unquote, by the way. She ran into the principal's son, who was a student at the school in the hallway, and he said something to the extent of, the very sight of you makes me want to grab a gun. Oh my god, this is absurd. She goes through this all year long. And by the way, this is one of those schools where it's kindergarten through 12th grade. She had two younger siblings. They were feeling some of the effects of this too. So anyway, all this happens. A year later, 
She's still at the school. She tries out for girls basketball again. She makes the team. And guess what happens at the end of their game? Still say the Lord's Prayer. And this time we have video. So let me show you video of the Lord's Prayer taking place after this game. I don't know if sound will work, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> Nicole. Liberty and justice for all. Yeah. Well, that's nice though, right? Like some girl put her arms around Nicole at the end. That's sweet. Turns out that girl said to her, don't worry, I forgive you and God forgives you. Oh. <laughs> And then the next day, Nicole was kicked off the team again. Uh, oh. This time, the coach said it's because you threatened to kill somebody. <laughs> what? Yeah. And at this point, her parents were like, we're not doing this again. They pulled her out of school. They pulled her younger siblings out of school. They were going to do homeschooling for, for the, that period. Keep in mind, she's a sophomore here. Like, she has a long way to go. They decided to homeschool them. Um, and they also eventually filed a civil lawsuit against the school, which is why we know all these quotations and all the stuff that happened. Um, uh, so anyway, here's the point though. Why did they treat her like this? Why were they so horrible about this? Because they see her, they know she's an atheist, and they see that immoral, horrible person. Um, just to make things bad, really bad right now. I think some point her junior year, she's like, I want to go back to school. I don't like being cooped up at home. So she went back for a day. And she ran into some kid who was also a brand new student to the school. She's like, hi, I'm Nicole. And this kid, who she'd never met before, is like, oh, I've heard all about you. You're that devil-worshipping girl. <laughs> and she's bawling. And she leaves. And she didn't go back. So how horrible is this? And the thing is, this story didn't get that much attention. It got a little attention because American Atheists was representing her in that civil lawsuit. Um, years later, 2020, did a very small segment about her story. That's the only reason people really heard about this. But this is not that much of an anomaly. This sort of thing happens all the time. This was a public um, school? This was what? This was a public school? Public system? school in Oklahoma, yeah. Wow. So this happened. There was a book that came out a couple years ago by this wonderful author, Catherine Stewart, who wrote about this club called the Good News Club. It's like an elementary school campus crusade for Christ sort of club. <laughs> but she actually mentioned Nicole in her book. And she said, for every Nicole, there are perhaps thousands who join the circle and mumble the words. Which, by the way, that would totally have been me. I can tell you that. Many students praying at their sporting endeavors are non theists or members of other religious traditions, but they know that the locker room is no place for dissent and that a refusal to participate could easily be construed as a sign of lack of commitment to the team. They have learned that they have to pray to play. How true is that, right? Because how many of us would have just joined that circle so we avoid exactly that from happening? Okay, so that's the sad part of the whole talk. Here's the good news. It's gotten so much better since that time. Like, things are so much better. If this happened today, you would all know about it. <laughs> you would all have some form of action you could take to help her out. If you live close to her, you can go to a school board meeting or something. But, like, we would be able to, like, band together in her defense. And let's talk about why that's happened and what's kind of led this change. This is a study from the Pew Research Center. And basically, what we want to know is what percent of people have no religious affiliation? And this is commonly referred to as the nuns or the unaffiliated. It doesn't mean they're all atheists, but it does mean that even if they believe in a higher power, even if they believe in Jesus, they don't call themselves any religious label. So just keep that in mind. But if you look at the red line at the very bottom, that's the oldest generation, like the greatest generation born before 1928. We're only talking about 5% of them who are unaffiliated. Most old people believe in God, and they have a religious label to go with it. Um, if you look at the yellow one, the silent generation, before 1945, it's 8%. Let's go to the baby boomers. Now it's about 13% of them are unaffiliated. What about Generation uh, X, born before 1980? 20% non-religious. And then you get to the millennials. 26%. People born after 1981. This includes me, this includes everyone in college and even grad school right now. 26%. There was a study that came out, I believe, yesterday that put this number at about 33%. And that went up to the age of 34. 
So I mean, we're talking like a third or a quarter of young people have no religious affiliation anymore. And that's a huge change from what it used to be. Here's another way of kind of looking at the same information. How many people would agree with the statement, I never doubt the existence of God? If you are hardcore religious, you never have any doubts, right? All this generation, like 90% of them, they say, I never have any doubts. What about slightly younger? The uh, silent generation, still pretty high. Baby boomers, okay, it's a little lower. I don't know what number that is, maybe like 85, 90, somewhere in there. Most of them, though, they, they never have doubts. Uh, generation X, again, like 80%. Then check out what's happening with the millennials. That thing is like a hockey stick. Like, it's <laughs> shooting downward. What does that say? It doesn't mean they're all losing their faith. But they're all saying, yeah, I question my faith sometimes. And questioning is really bad for religion. So like, this number just keep, seems to keep going down. This is also to one last one. This came out just a couple weeks ago. Um, the percentage of college freshmen who say they have no religious affiliation. Look at the years from like 1971 on the left to 2013 on the right. It just keeps going up. People who say they have no religious affiliation. This is a trend that has not stopped yet. More people are fed up with at least organized religion, if not religion. Okay, so why is that happening? Why are we seeing this trend where people are getting less and less religious, or at least organized religion? Why is that happening? Yell it out. Internet. Internet. Yeah. We'll talk about that. What else? Science is getting better. Science is getting better. Science was fine, but well, it keeps yeah. getting better. Yeah. Education levels, perhaps? Uh, um, you know what? So this edu the education level is a different issue. But you're right. Like, uh, we've always known that people with higher degrees of like formal education, they do tend to have less religious belief. But that's across the board. So if that was the only thing that would be true, you would see that happening with every generation. You know. So this is beyond just a formal education thing. Yeah. Scandals, church scandals. Church scandals. scandals. We'll talk about that, yeah. Society. What about society? Well, but like way back in the past, where if you didn't believe in God, you pretty much had to shut up yeah. about it because everybody else is like, there's a lot of peer <coughs> pressure there, but now society's gotten a little less. More tolerant of yeah, atheists in a more, sense? Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me pinpoint about four. Hey, what is it? How about immigration. Immigration? Um, Actually, what's, it, yeah, it, what's interesting, if you look at like the Hispanic population in the U.S., as more Hispanic people immigrate to the U.S., they're bringing along with them a lot less Catholicism than ever before, which is amazing. But yeah, this trend is like, it crosses uh, ethnic lines, things like that, too. Let's go one more. Yeah. Yeah. A, a related point to that, the, just because the, there, there are more people with different religions, people are coming more tolerant of that, and so they're more willing to be tolerant of atheists. Yeah, I think that we're living in a more diverse society, too, so you come across people who disagree with you when it comes to religion, and you just deal with it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, and we'll talk about that, too. Let me pinpoint four big reasons I think we've seen this shift, and they kind of talk about some of the things we touched on here. Here's the first one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, close your eyes. Not to get political on you, but the reason, I, basically you had a very conservative US president for eight years, and we saw what happens when you kind of merge religion with government. I don't know if people remember this, like right before 9-11 happened, maybe a couple months before, George Bush went on television and prime time and said, I'm gonna like very much limit the amount of lines available for stem cell research because my faith tells me it's basically abortion or something ridiculous like that. But people saw what was happening with religion in the government and there was a reaction to it. And by the way, it's not unique to Bush. We're seeing it now with Obama too where why do you have so much uh, right-wing reaction? You have the Tea Party, you have these uh, right-wing candidates running for president already who are very much anti everything the president is. You see it all the time. And especially when you have a president who's been in power for eight years, you're gonna see a reaction to it no matter what. And it just so happened that in the middle of 9-11, when we're going, when we're seeing religion in government, this is the guy in charge, and people were like, I don't like religion as much anymore. And they start backing away from that. So that's that's a big part of it. Here's another reason. These books started to come out. Sam Harris started writing this book, guess what date? 9-11. September 12th. September 12th, 2001. 
started writing the book. It came out in 2004, and it was, it, it, as much as you could say, there's a book that kind of uh, revolutionized a whole genre, this was it. Richard Dawkins said he had been wanting to write about God for years, hmm. and his editors and his agent always said, like, no one's gonna, no one's gonna read that. Keep writing about science. So he did. But after this came out, they're like, yeah, you can go ahead and write about God now. <laughs> and so The God Delusion came out two years later. We had Christopher Hitchens' book, Daniel Dennett's book. But here's the thing. It's not that these books necessarily turned you into an atheist, though I've heard from plenty of people who say it did help. It's that these books were so popular, the mainstream media was forced to talk about religion. I mean, we're kind of seeing it now with Islam, too. I mean, Ayan Hirsi Ali's book came out this week. On Fox News, like the whole week, you saw just interviews with her about how do we fix this like problem of radical Islam. Um, people start, I mean, you have these authors going on The Daily Show. They go on mainstream news channels talking about atheism, and it's not a taboo topic anymore. It's something very real. So these books kind of usher in that this is something we want to talk about. I think when this came out, like Rick Warren and Sam Harris had a debate on religion on the pages of Time Magazine. Like, it's a big deal. So that's happened. We mentioned the internet. So let's talk about Reddit. Let's talk about the internet. Reddit, by the way, for those of you who have heard of it and use it, this has more than 2 million members on their forum. It's the largest atheist forum online. But here's what it does. When I was 14 and I was in high school and I was starting to have doubts about my religion, I didn't know who to talk to. I didn't know there were books about it. So I would like wait till my parents were asleep, go on AOL dial-up late at night, <laughs> and, tr and there wasn't Google either. So it'd be like, uh, what happens if you don't believe in God, weird AOL machine? And there would be these couple websites that pop up, and they're written by people who are totally weird and creepy, because it looks like it from their website. But I would read them, and I'm like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Like, that's weird that I kind of agree with this. And then it just started happening more and more. If you are a high school atheist right now, think about what uh, resources you have at your disposal. Between entire books, between uh, running blog commentary, podcasts, YouTube, this is a site where you can go anonymously and ask questions and get feedback about stuff. You're not isolated. It, I mean, it would be almost impossible for you to have access to the internet and think you are the only atheist in your community. What's even cooler is with our phones, we can go to church if you have to because your parents make you, and when the pastor says something, you could be like, let me look that up on Snopes. <laughs> Citation needed for whatever the pastor says. Like, I know you're wrong because I just found it out while you were preaching. <laughs> so basically, the internet is where religion goes to die. So, um, one last thing. So all this stuff started happening, and it's all happening in the past decade. And then the church started being stupid. <laughs> they started shooting themselves in the start. foot. <laughs> <laughs> Very much publicly. Yeah, sorry. So we talked about the sex scandals, and that's, that did not help. But there's a group <coughs> called the Barna Group, which is like the Gallup polling of the church world. <coughs> they were curious why so many people still believe in God, still say they believe in the divinity of Jesus, but they don't call themselves Christians. They're like, who are these people? Because they should be one of us, but they're not. And they asked them, why did you leave the church? Because that's what they all did. What answers do you think they gave for why they left their church? And mind you, we're talking about mostly non-denominational evangelical Christians. Homophobia? Homophobia. Local politics. They get involved in politics, local politics? Well, you know, the uh, small-time politicians. Sure, politicking in church, yeah. No answers. Feminism, I think, I heard. Feminist issues. Abortion. Abortion issues. Anti-science. Anti-science? So only about half of them are the reasons they gave, which is fascinating. Like, you missed a whole bunch of big ones. One, too insular. Christian, the Christians who left church said, we feel like we're in a bubble all the time. Like, I want to hang out with people who are Muslim and atheists, and they're my friends at school, but my church says you should hang out with us. They felt like they were living in a bubble. They wanted out. Too irrelevant. The stuff they talked about at church didn't matter. And this is cool. When I was writing I Sold My Soul on eBay, the publisher sent me to a church in Michigan that was run by this guy I had never heard of, but who was super popular among younger Christians that I knew, named Rob Bell. And he ran this big church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I was like, why is this guy so popular? I didn't know. And I went there. I couldn't find the church because they didn't have signs. There was no cross. 
it was just a rundown mall, and you had to know the church was there because they didn't have signs. And the whole place was just an empty space with a podium in the middle. And here's what was cool. One of the associate pastors gets up there. By the way, the whole crowd, all young people. Like, I think everyone was under 30. I just could have sworn, like, looking around me. As opposed to every other church I went to where you would find maybe one or two under 30. But this pastor gets up on stage. He's like, did you guys see the front page of today's paper? It says that the population of Grand Rapids, 25% of the population of Grand Rapids, is living below the poverty line. That's horrible. What are we doing as a church to fix that? Oh, that's an awesome question. And everyone there is like, yes, what can we do? And you knew they were going to have small group discussions on this over the course of the week. That's what they mean by relevant. That's a problem that affects them. They don't care about the fire and brimstone and the hellfire and abortion. Like, yeah, just let people do what they want. That wasn't an issue for them. They want to talk about things that were relevant. Two anti-science. Not just evolution, by the way. They didn't like when their pastors railed against global warming or just treated science like a dirty word. Of two sex negative. They hated the idea that abstinence was the only way to go and that if you did anything, not even sex, if you did anything, you were committing this horrible sin. I've heard stories of like Christian sex ed classes. Sometimes these make their way into the public school, which is when you hear about them. But they would do things like, here's a cup of water. Take this, spit in it, Pass it down the line. Everyone's spitting a cup of water. You're the last one with a cup of water. Do you want to take a sip of that water? No? That's what happens if you're with someone who's had sex before. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, if you like understand sex education, and you, you want to know more. They felt like they weren't learning anything. They knew better than what they were being taught and what the church was promoting. Uh, too exclusive. This is saying, who's your best friend? Oh, they're Jewish? they're going to burn in hell for all of eternity. And they're like, no, my friend's awesome. And just because they don't believe in God, that, that doesn't make sense that they would be tortured for, in hellfire forever. I, that, I don't believe that. So they didn't buy this exclusivity. You have to believe what we do, the way we do, if you want to go to heaven. Um, and finally, they're too anti-doubt. They knew that if you had questions about your faith, if you doubted what the pastor said, the church was not a safe space to ask those questions. So where did they go to get those questions answered? The internet. The internet. <laughs> and that plays right into our hands, because we own the internet. <laughs> so all of these things happen, I swear, over the past, the, the, over the past 10 years, uh, in different ways. But all this is happening at the same time. Church leaders right now don't know what hit them. All they know is young people are leaving church in droves, and they have no idea how to plug the leak right now. And then you started having, with all this happening, people started writing more stories about atheism. I've been asked, like, why is my website called Friendly Atheist? It's not because I'm nice. I'm not nice. It's because every time I saw a story, whenever I was coming up with a name, if I saw a story in the news about atheists, it always said, angry atheist, militant atheist, staunch atheist. It never said, happy, smiling atheist. <laughs> and, like, I know enough atheists where I'm like, yeah, they're pretty happy like all the time around each other anyway. <laughs> yeah. So how come? So basically, uh, we started seeing positive stories about atheism too. Let me share with you a couple of what I'm talking about. This was in the New York Times a couple of years ago. It's a story about a high school atheist group in Florida. And the story is that they exist. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> like, oh my god, they're atheists in a high school and they gather. <laughs> And what was really cool is you're reading the story and you're like, wow, these kids, I mean, there's nothing wrong with these kids. They're just gathering to discuss their, their non-belief. And then they have these couple lines in the story um, that are heartbreaking. There are students who do not want their parents to know they belong to an atheist club. I tell my mother I'm at Ocean Club. <laughs> like, first of all, that's a bad lie. Don't use that because that's not a thing. But, but like, come on, who has to lie about where they are after school at a club? Like, no one who belongs to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes has to do that, I promise you. Um, another one, same article. Um, she asked that her, another member said her father would be angry and disappointed in her. Uh, she asked that her name not be used for fear would hurt her father. I don't want us to grow apart over this. Oh my god, like, how do you not feel for this anonymous student? That's crazy. And again, New York Times, this is big time coverage. I, when I was writing the Young Atheist Survival Guide, I got a chance to talk to the faculty sponsor of this club. And I'm like, trying to get more information. Like, how did this article even happen? 
How big is this group, by the way, for a high school? 40 kids a week comes, which is crazy. He said about 10 of them, quarter of them, not even atheists. But they know that this is the only space where they can be challenged, where they can debate and discuss these things, and we're not going to judge them like, yeah, okay, you're Christian, that's fine. Let's talk about this stuff. Because they don't have these debates in their Christian clubs. I, I had a college atheist group when I went to school, and every week we would have two students coming from Moody Bible Institute, very hardcore uh, religious group. Two students would come to every one of our meetings. They were awesome, by the way. They always participated. It's nice because otherwise it'd just be a bunch of us like nodding our heads at each other. But and at some point I'm like, so why do you guys come here? Like, why do you come here every week? Because you have to take the train. It's not easy to get to our school. And they're like, because we don't get these types of discussions at our school. No one challenges us. You guys challenge us all the time. We think you're wrong, but we do challenge us all the time. And we like that. We like to be challenged because we think it helps our faith. And they weren't getting that at their school. And by the way, I also asked the professor, I'm like, how did the kids even know to come to you as a faculty sponsor? And he said, you know, I've been there for 30 years. You know, he has ten years, he's not worried about getting fired. But he's like, every year, he teaches international baccalaureate classes. Like, for the good students. He teaches philosophy, and they discuss religion. And he says, um, and he talks about religion, the kids always ask him, Mr. Creamer, where do you go to church? And he always said, oh, I don't want to... I don't care. It doesn't matter where I go to church. This is about what you guys believe. Why don't you guys discuss where you go and what's right and wrong and figure this out? And then he realized no other teacher at the school gives that answer. <laughs> the kids ask their other teachers about church all the time, and every teacher's like, oh, I go to this church, and you should come with me to church. It's a great church. He's like, how come I'm the only one hiding who I am here? So finally, a couple years ago, he's like, I'm not going to do it. If they ask me, I will be honest. So finally, in class one day, they ask him, where do you go to church? He said, you know what? I don't go to church, and my wife doesn't go to church. We're, we're both atheists, actually. And he's like bracing himself. And the kids are like, oh, eh. <laughs> they totally didn't care. It was just a non-issue for them, because at this point, they all knew other atheists. So it wasn't a surprise. Um, and then a couple kids came up to him at some point in the year, and they said, we want to start a group. Can you be our faculty sponsor? And that's how the group started. Um, Similar thing, by the way, I don't know if you guys have seen this coverage, but like anytime a city council uh, in the US does any <coughs> religious thing, we might contact the Freedom From Religion Foundation or the American Human Association and get a threat of a lawsuit going. Um, I've worked with the Secular Student Alliance, which is like a national uh, college high school atheist group, um, and we always tell students, you don't need lawsuits involved. If anything happens at your school, or if anything happens with an administrator that's like preventing you from doing what you know is legal, just talk to a journalist. <laughs> go, go find a local reporter, because their stories are usually boring anyway. They love conflict. There's nothing more controversial than atheists at school. So this is what has happened a few times. This is a girl named Crystal Myers. She went to high school in Tennessee. Amazing student, like student body president, swim team captain, editor-in-chief of the school paper. Um, I was on my school paper. It was difficult getting anyone to write articles for us. And so she wrote an article for her school paper talking about how much it sucked to be an atheist at her school, how hard it was. And not because she wanted to get the school in trouble, she just wanted to point out, like, when I walk into class and I see these Bible verses on my chalkboard, on the teacher's chalkboard, I feel excluded. By the way, that's illegal. You shouldn't be doing that in the first place. But her point was just, it, it excludes me, and I don't think people realize that. The district said, you can't publish that. So again, somehow, the press got a hold of this. <laughs> and they're like, well, that's interesting. So they wrote an article about Crystal. And then they're like, you wrote an article that they won't publish? We will publish it. <laughs> so the Knoxville News Sentinel, huge paper, by the way, they published her article in full on their paper's website, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, this just happened a couple weeks ago. Uh, these young ladies in uh, Maine, Portland, Maine, I believe, they are... Uh, they are class presidents, like class council, so they do the morning announcements. And so they have to say, you know, let's stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance over the intercom every day. A couple weeks ago, they started doing a thing where they say, uh, stand up and say the pledge if you'd like to. Because it is optional, even though most kids don't know that. And after about a day or two of that, their principal's like, stop it. <laughs> They're in the process right now of convincing their school board that they should be allowed to say those four words. Um, and by the way, I should say, to his credit, 
the principal has been very supportive of them saying, the only reason I stopped them is because they're breaking protocol. But he's like, I'm glad they're doing this. And I, I just want them to get a formal approval from the school board. Like, he's been very supportive in the media and everything. So there's that. Let me show you one more thing. We've also seen in the past 10 years, we've seen a lot of atheist mainstream characters on television who are awesome. Like, they're not curmudgeonly. They're not angry. They're just, like, happy, joyful characters. It's weird. Um, here's a clip from Glee, which is, like, a, the show is called Glee. But the, even if you haven't seen the show, one of the characters, very likable character, uh, is talking about how his father is sick. And I believe a student said, like, we'll pray for him. Your voice is stunning, but I don't believe in God. Wait, what? You've all professed your beliefs. I'm just stating mine. I think God is kind of like Santa Claus for adults. Anyways, <laughs> God's kind of a jerk, isn't he? When he makes me gay and then has his followers going around telling me it's something that I chose, as if someone would choose to be mocked every single day of their life. And right now, I don't want a heavenly father. I want my real one back. But Kurt, how do you know for sure? You can't prove that there's no God. You can't prove that there isn't a magic teapot floating around on the dark side of the moon with a dwarf inside of it that reads romance novels and shoots lightning out of its boobs, but it seems pretty lightning, doesn't it? <laughs> we shouldn't be talking like this. It's not right. Oh, sorry, Quinn. But you all can believe whatever you want to. But I can't believe something I don't. I appreciate your thoughts. But I don't want your prayers. Damn. <laughs> and he's the likable character on the show. I've seen like ABC Family sitcoms, like home improvement type of shows, where like the daughter comes home and she's like, I don't, I was in biology class and I don't think I believe in God. And like, it's scary. And she talks to her younger brother and they're like, oh my God, what are you going to do? And then like Reba McIntyre's the mom and she comes in like, uh, what's going on? And the daughter like confesses and you hear the music overhead and it's like, oh my God, this is a conflict. And then at the end of the episode, the mom's like, that's okay, don't come to church, it's all right. <laughs> you should have these questions. You gotta figure this out for yourself. End of the show. Like, it's the weirdest thing to see. That happens. Um, I've also seen college students do some really cool things, just having fun with science, having <laughs> a photo op. I like the graveyard of the gods. These are all the gods that we no longer believe in. <laughs> Where is yours gonna be? <laughs> um, I also like, uh, on Facebook, every year, you kind of see people change their profile pictures to just say I'm an atheist somehow. Maybe they do it subtly with just the A, but sometimes they're, they're very blunt about it. Um, I saw this, like, uh, I'm an atheist, and I'm gay, and I'm an uncle. Um, I'm an atheist that didn't comb his hair this morning. Hi, I'm an atheist, and I also speak Spanish. Hello, I'm an atheist. I'm an atheist, and I love you. How can you be mad at these people? They're not horrible people. And then just to bookend what I said at the beginning about Nicole's story. Um, so it turns out, about 10 years after <coughs> Nicole's thing happened, so like a couple years ago, there was a girl named Jessica in Rhode Island who went through a lot of the same stuff. So when she was a freshman in high school, she goes to her auditorium for an assembly. She sees a mural painted on the wall that says, you know, dear God, help us in our athletics, help us in academics, amen, something like that. And she's like, oh, that shouldn't be there. So she started a Facebook group that said, we should take down that mural. And all of a sudden, the, the ACLU is like, you know, some lady tried to file a lawsuit to get that removed, but she had no standing. She wasn't at the school. She had no kids in the school. So it didn't go anywhere. If you want to do something, you're a freshman. I mean, we could do something with this. And she ended up being a plaintiff. So they filed a lawsuit. And a year later, uh, I think this is her junior year when it finally came down, middle of junior year, judge says, you're right the mural has to come down. And so after that, everyone starts harassing her again, as you might expect, because atheists won this case in a conservative area. So kids are saying, under God, in the pledge, they're talking crap about her in the hallways, you know, pointing at her, saying nasty things. Now imagine, now we're in a time of Facebook and Twitter, so they're sending threats on Twitter, rape threats, death threats, she's a young woman, that happens, right? But here's the thing. Because there was so much support for her, because people knew about Jessica's case this time, they were ready to help out in any way possible. So people were monitoring her Twitter thread, her Twitter page, and they saw the responses coming in under her handle. So when a threat came in, they were quick to take screenshots, 
they quickly sent them to the police or the principal if it was a student at the school. And now it's like, hey, someone's making a threat against a student. What are you going to do about it? They can't ignore it at this point. There are people who went to her school board meetings in support of her. Um, after the verdict came in, uh, a state senator, her state senator, went mm -hmm. on the radio and the host asked, oh, so senator, like, what do you think about this uh, Jessica girl and her verdict? And the senator said, she's an evil little thing. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> that happened. He's her senator. She's a 16-year-old girl. <laughs> and he called her an evil little thing. But again, this is the internet. So people made shirts that said evil little thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then uh, we started, I wish I could take credit for this, I can't, but we started on my website a fundraiser for college for her, and people chipped in a lot of money there, like 50000 on the website. The people who made the t-shirts are like, take the money, put it towards the scholarship, we don't want to make any money off of this. Mm -hmm. You had people sending money to the American Humanist Association, so like, we just want her to like, get the hell out of Rhode Island for when she goes to college. And a couple years ago, I was able to give her this check, which was awesome. Um, and it was like for $63,000 for college scholarship. And by the way, you know that would have been there for Nicole too. But we were not organized then. The demographics hadn't shifted as much then. We didn't hear about this stuff as much. But I'm telling you, when this stuff happens now, we are on it. There are people supportive of it. There are media who is going to cover it. And it gets the attention. Um, and one happy ending to end this with. That's Nicole. She graduated. She got the hell out of Oklahoma, and she's doing really well. I think she was a singer. She even and her uh, she played in a band with her siblings. They released like an album. She released a solo album, just singing. Like I don't know if anyone heard it, but like she did that, and she's doing well and stuff now, which is like good. It got better for her too. Um, anyway, there's my contact information. If you ever have any questions or concerns or. Um, otherwise, we can do a Q&A now, and if I can answer anything, I'd love to do it. But again, thank you, uh, Sue, and everyone for bringing me in. You talked about young people's uh, views on atheism changing rapidly. Yeah. So I suspect this, this is going to be an ex exponential curve. When do you see a tipping point in the U.S.? When do you see... 50%. Yeah, oh, so the question is like, when are we going to see this tipping point of 50% non-religious, I yeah, guess? Yeah, yeah. For, for younger people anyway? Um, you know what? It's, it looks like it's going to happen soon. I, I don't know what date that would be, but it doesn't look like we're seeing any like plateau happening right now. With the 33% is the highest I've ever seen, but it looks like it keeps heading in that direction. Um, I would add, like, in 2012, when we held the U.S. presidential elections, Gallup does a poll every four years, like, would you vote for someone in your political party who held your values and happened to be blank? And they ask, like, hey, would you be okay with someone who was black? And yeah, now it's like 90, some high 90%. No one has a problem with that. What about voting for a woman? High 90s. It was low before, but it's high 90s now. What about gay? That's like 70, some percent. So in 2012, atheist, which had always been at the bottom of everything they rank, Atheist went to like 54%, and it was exciting, because we were still at the bottom of the list, but it was more than half. <laughs> uh, but it does look like we are getting to this point where it's, you really can't go anywhere anymore without running into someone who isn't your religion anymore. Do you think like, Obama's an atheist? Man, I so want to speculate and say yes, but the answer is no. Like, everything he said, everything he's ever done. He flip-flopped on uh, gay marriage. Yeah, has evolved, right? Yeah, but there's I mean, you can argue it's for political uh, efficiency and whatnot, yeah. but he hasn't done anything. And if anything, he's only like expanded the Office of Faith-Based Initiatives. He's done a lot to like, he has a faith-based uh, advisory board, and there's no secular voice on that list, too. There's Muslims on it, there's Christians, Jews, there's no secular voice on that. So I mean, everything he's done suggests that he really is Christian, as he says he is. So, I mean, even if you want to speculate otherwise, which it's very tempting to do, <coughs> it doesn't do us any good. Um, by the way, right now, 535 members of Congress, and not a single one yeah. is an out atheist. So there's a lot of liars there. <laughs> there is a, yeah, yeah. I, you can almost it's bet your life there, there are people who are there who, there are like eight who say they are unaffiliated, but they will not say they don't believe in God. So it's frustrating. You're, we're kind of hoping, I mean, I'm kind of just hoping one of them knows they're going to retire, 
And then it's like, I don't have to campaign anymore, so now I can be honest and open about it. Didn't, didn't Barney Frank admit it? Barney Frank admitted it after he left office, right. but in his book that just came out, he took it back. He's like, they, I mean, we joked about me not believing in God, but uh, no, I'm not an atheist. Um, and he gave one of those waffly definitions of an atheist, but like, even he took it back, and he's like one of the most liberal guys you'll find. So it is still tough to be an atheist, even no matter who you are. And there are some very liberal members of Congress. They are not openly atheists. So, yes. I'm just wondering uh, because I, I, you know, I think there, perhaps from my own perspective, there is a difference between Canada and the United States. There are some significant differences in yeah. these areas. Like this, like this stuff you're saying. How is this actually legal within a public school system? Yeah, this is not that, Nicole I was talking that about. Is, to my knowledge, I mean to. You know, from my own personal experience going through, so, like none of that would actually could not have happened. Yeah, are you talking like mean, prayers like, and, right. and and yeah. things like that? That's so, not being, being allowed. In right. The thing is, like in order to so this stuff happens all the time. You're right. It is illegal. So basically, as soon as you know about it, you can do something about it. So the Freedom from Religion. I'm not a lawyer, but I've worked with them a lot. The Freedom from Religion Foundation. If they heard a story like Nicole's. Here's what they would do. They would send a letter to the school saying, we heard you were doing the following things. We asked you to stop. And if the school says, yeah, we're doing it, and we're not going to stop, then we can talk about a possible lawsuit, right? Because it is illegal. But unless someone complains, unless someone whistle blows on what's going on, nothing happens. So I'll give you an example. High school football teams, public high school football teams, especially in the South, so many of them have coach-led prayers before games. That is illegal. They have prayers over the loudspeakers. That's also illegal. But who's going to complain? If you're on the football team, you don't want to be the one to ruin the party for everyone else. If you're a student at the school, you hope they know enough to know that that's wrong. But again, when you're living in that culture, it's kind of hard to realize, oh, this isn't what you're supposed to be doing. This is a problem. Um, so it's a matter of like, someone has to stand up and say this. Uh, I'll give you another example. A couple weeks, uh, maybe a month ago, I've been talking to this kid via email. He emailed me a while ago and he said, I'm an atheist, I'm in high school, I'm scared, I'm in Texas. Like, and I gave him some advice on what to do, uh, but he said, my principal says prayers over the loudspeaker every morning. I'm like, he cannot do that. That's, that's literally illegal. He can't do it. But we need proof that he's doing it. Like, can you record him at all? And he says, I don't have a phone, like a special phone to do that with. So I really can't. I'm like, okay, well, take care of yourself. Like, don't worry about it. Just you know, when you, when you get older, maybe, who knows, he's a freshman. He emails me, then, that was in October, he emailed me in like late February, he's like, so I got a new phone. <laughs> I have some recordings. And basically the recordings were the principal saying, here's the Bible verse, oh. quoting chapter and verse. And finally, the Freedom From Religion Foundation is like, holy crap, that same school we were told does prayers at football games. They sent them a letter last fall, and the district wrote back and said, Oh, you said we pray over the intercom and we pray at football? Yeah, no, we don't. <laughs> and the FFRF at that point, they cannot do anything. You can't pursue it because they don't have any further proof of it, right? Now they had some recordings, so they sent another letter with that. The courts are on our side on this, but it's a matter of bringing it to court. And it, that's a lot of hassle. And like, it's so hard to ask a 15-year-old kid, hey, put your whole social um, <laughs> like acceptance on the line for this principled stance. That's not easy to do. So it does happen. It happens a lot. But what I think what's starting to happen is people are quicker to realize that, oh, I've seen this happen and it's not right. And they're beginning to do more whistleblowing from the students. Yeah. But like I said, I mean, my, my experience within the Canadian school yeah. system is like none of that crap could actually happen. <laughs> I would hope. I you mean, know, from my experience covering you know, it, yeah. Like I praying seen. in school. Like in public school, I mean, it's one thing if you're going to a faith-based faith school, school, if right. you're going to a separate, you know, but to go to pub, what's considered public school. I know, I like, know. That's not... In Illinois, where uh, I'm from, they actually passed a law to do a, it was literally called, like, the Prayer Act, so they could get prayer in school. Then the lawmaker was told, you can't do that, so they changed it to a moment of silence, and Silent Prayer Act. That's the name of the legislation. So for the past several years, like, we had to do a moment of silence in school. That was really just a 
legislative ploy to get prayer I mean, it happens all the time, and they get tricked. They, it's a whack-a-mole thing. You find one way to stop it, they'll figure out another way to do it. It happens, unfortunately. Let me go into the black. Yeah. Yes, and then. Uh, yes, you're talking about the thing about anti science and so forth. I, I don't know. If you know I, I just got my copy of National Geographic, and there's a whole article in there about anti science, yeah. in particular in the U.S. And the, and the question I have is that do you not think that, that, that given the issues that are going on, particularly in, in your country, and even ours too, in terms of what's happened, I mean, the, the most reputable organization in the world is the American Academy of Sciences, yeah. right? And you know about them. You know what they have on their web site where they compare religion and science as being equal ways of looking at the world. Uh -huh. yeah. And so you know that if you had a grade six exam and you asked that question, they would fail a grade six exam. Yeah. And so my point is, is that do you not think that the scientific community has a responsibility or is being irresponsible when so much of this stuff is coming out yeah. and you see the people running the one guy that just announced in there, yeah. like why don't they come out and start to say, look, people have the freedom of speech. Nobody's questioning that, okay? But in terms of, of, of you know, science, whether it's, it's, uh, it's uh, climate change, evolution, that's science, okay? Right. And those are the things that have to be taught in school. Are you asking why they don't like say well, no I, religion as much? Well, yes. Wait, the other thing too is that the highest proportion of atheists in the world is also correlated with very high education. Right. Not all atheists, but those are among the highest correlations, okay. right? So, but I think my point is the scientific community now, especially, needs to come out and yeah. start to talk about these things. So this is so that's not my world, but I can right. say this. I think a lot of it is just um, counterintuitively strategic. And the reason is they don't want to alienate the people they're trying to bring along. So I'll give you an example. If you ever see Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is awesome and I love the guy, he hates talking about religion. Hates it. If you ask him, are you an atheist? No, no. I, I, don't, I'm, I don't believe in God. But he, just, he shies away from the word. Why? Because he knows that if he wants to reach people who need to hear about science, coming out like in a Richard Dawkins-esque style and saying religion is wrong on these issues and being very forceful about it will alienate the people who need to hear them the most. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what they're saying. Like The science academies that say, like, look, there are brilliant scientists who also believe in God. They would rather push that thing and say these, these are not in conflict even though, like you, I, I believe that they are totally in conflict. But they want to push that because they think they can try to string along some of these religious people who might have been opposed to it otherwise. I think it would hurt them a lot more if they just said, look, this, yep. you cannot believe in evolution if you are an evangelical Christian. These are incompatible things. They would be doing more damage to themselves. So yeah, philosophically, like I agree. Like I think it's dumb. I wish they would be more forceful about it. But I think they, believe me, they've had those discussions, I'm sure. And I think that was their just like, we don't want to get in this game. We want to stay out of it. Uh, but again, I think that also does a lot of damage to them. So it's, it's a tough call. I think that's why. Yes? Yeah, I, I was at an event earlier this week called uh, Secularism, Bridging the Divide. And there were no secularists. Well, there was one secularist. Yeah. Divided. But the, the agenda of the entire three-day event was how do we get religion back into the public square? Yeah. square? This is in Canada, right? Yeah. Um, so what I'm seeing, and I don't know if you see it as well, and I wonder if this, this is a strategic question, um, because atheists are on the rise, we're becoming more vocal, we're becoming more accepted, that we're now also seeing a pushback to that. Sure. That we're seeing religion, that they're kind of, they got their backs against the wall a little bit, and I'm wondering if you see, how you, how you see that strategically working out from our side because we don't want to fight, we just want to get along. Right, well it's weird because the place where I see a lot of that pushback lately has been in like local governments where they try to have more prayers before <coughs> meetings and stuff. And they're always saying like it's because people want to take God out of government or something, which totally misrepresents <coughs> our usual position on this. But uh, yeah, it's, it's funny to watch them talk about how there's no too much atheism in government because again, we have no officers. We, we don't hold those positions of power um, and then you're talking to a board that's like four out of five people are deeply Christian. It's, it's happening. I, I don't know if it's a pushback to us, but it's a constant, we're always persecuted, belief, among a lot of religious people. No matter what's going on, we are always persecuted. 
and it kind of, you've got to point out, like, no, you have it pretty good, like, if you're an evangelical Christian in the U.S., you're doing all right. Yeah. Um, and they, they really don't feel that. They feel, I mean, Ted Cruz said it in his speech, like, we are taking our freedom back. Like, you have plenty. You're yeah. plenty. <laughs> um, but the fact that you have a presidential candidate of a major party who can give his campaign address at a religious school, and like, this is just the most normal thing in the world nowadays in that party. Like, that just tells you how much power they have. Can you just stop calling him a Canadian? What is that? <laughs> can you stop calling that guy a Canadian? We really don't <laughs> no, take him back. No, 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 no. It was just born here, that's yeah. all it was. Yes. <laughs> share a funny story with you. I went through this in the, in the 70s, yeah. Madeline Murray O'Hare yeah. and all this kind of stuff. So when finally they abolished the prayer, the you know, lead prayer yeah. in the public schools, there's a, a really <clears throat> wonderful, funny, famous story of a, a college in Oklahoma that, of course, at this point, they, as you were saying, they couldn't do the prayer at the football game. Right. So. Rather than do that, whoever it was that introduced the game, there was the moment of silence. And during the moment of silence, someone sneezed. And the entire faculty and everybody there went, God bless you. <laughs> so that was, that, was the way, that was the way they got around Again, it's whack-a-mole, right? You push them down one way, they'll find they'll another find way to do it. Exactly. And again, you know what we've seen in some places where, I'll give you another example, in high school, public high schools, you cannot have invocations, you can't have prayers at a high school graduation. So what some administrators will do is they're like, well, we have some student speakers who are usually the ones who do the prayer. So they're like, legally speaking, what can you do? They've had students vote on whether to hold the prayer. Well, of course that's going to go in the way of whatever the Christians want to do. So eventually that got shut down. Then they're like, well, students can give speeches, but we don't look at them in advance. So that way we can't be held responsible. And they've gotten away with that a lot of ways, a lot of times too. So again, they'll find a way to do it. But again, in theory, what you're saying with the God bless you, that, that is legal. But that is a different thing from doing it over the loudspeaker for everyone to participate in. It's tough. But it was just a way to, you know, to say, we don't care what the law is, right. we're doing and it. I and face. we've heard plenty of pastors and people say that if the Supreme Court in the U.S. says gay marriage is legal everywhere in the country this summer, they don't care. They're going to fight back somehow against it. We, and that includes like the Alabama Supreme Court justice. Who said, I don't care what the law says. Exactly. Like, um, how many? Two more? Cool. Yes. It's in the States, uh, though, it seems like um, religion is sort of intertwined with patriotism. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like you have the Lord's Prayer and the anthem at the end of sporting yeah. events. And it's kind of like. And if you don't say the Pledge of Allegiance in school, you're considered, oh, why do you hate the country? Like, there's a lot of reasons people may not want to say it. And it's, yeah, it's, I guess it's political or, you know, it's, it's all about uh, brainwashing, conformity, etc. Yeah. Uh, it's frustrating. <laughs> yeah, we don't have that so much here, thank goodness. I know, it's good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me go back there and then uh, I'll be around afterwards if you guys have any other questions. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on the pledge, actually, so I'm kind of glad that you said that. There was the Don't Say the Pledge campaign that happened over the course, I think, of the last year. Yeah. And I'm just here, wondering, here. since your stats show that there's about 33% of young people that are uh, abstaining from religion or non-religious, was that reflected in the results of the Don't Say the Pledge yeah, um, campaign? I forgot the results of the poll you were talking about, but here's a, but that's a legitimate thing. Like if, like a third of young people are non-religious, yeah. shouldn't a third of them like not be for the pledge? I don't think they have any idea what they're saying. <laughs> As someone who was in school when kids were saying the pledge for several years. Most of them, like the second, like, oh, the pledge is on, all right, I'll just say the words. They have no idea what they're saying. They just do it. But the funny thing is if one person takes that stand, they're like, I'm not standing up because I don't want to say under God because I don't think I should be pledging allegiance to a country automatically. Like, they have to earn my, my pledge, whatever. Um, those are principal reasons for saying no to it. And when some kids do it, it's like, oh, I can do that? they start to follow. And I've heard plenty of stories of people like when one person did it, other kids in the class followed them as well. So I think, no, in reality, it doesn't match up with the one-third number, but I think it's because they have no idea. That's why I like what those uh, girls were doing in high school where they just said, if you want to, mm -hmm. you don't have to. That's a big deal because no one knows it's optional. Yeah. So many of them, even their teachers, without uh, bad intentions, yeah. they get mad when students don't stand up because they think it's mandatory too. 
And why would they think otherwise? No one's ever told them it wasn't. They just always did it too. So. Anyway, thank you again. I'll be around afterwards for a while if you have any other questions or you can send them to me.